Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. So today's podcast is about freedom, which I do love and I think we all love, and um, about a politician in Argentina who I've only recently found out about from you know my, my man Juan. Shout out to Juan. Um, and Markovic, who were talking about, you know, this guy, uh, um, like, oh, you know, he's um, the front runner to become president of Argentina. And he's uh, like a classical liberal, like so what you could call a libertarian these days in English. In English these days, liberal could mean extreme left, kind of, you know, like, um, <clears throat> or it could mean someone who believes in a limited government, which is the older traditional meaning basically liberal coming from liberty meaning let people do whatever they want so long as they're not uh, hurting other people so you have the right to um, your body your property and uh, you can do anything you want except there is this thing called the non-aggression principle that you must respect other people's right to their body and their property so you have your sphere of influence everyone has their own one Whenever they overlap, you know, we talk it through. And if there's a dis dispute, you know, the courts can take care of it. But basically, you can do, you know, the, the state, it's not the, the, the government's job to run the world. The, the government's job is to prevent mafias from taking over society or something. Um, basically, if you break the law, if you violate the non-aggression principle, armed dudes come and put you in prison. Um, and so... Like um, Javier Millet, uh, he, uh, I hadn't heard of him until these guys talked about him. And um, then Tucker Carlson, um, who's actually uh, you know, a very thoughtful guy. I mean, I, I suspect we don't agree on everything, but that's an important thing. You don't need to agree with everybody in order to listen to them and benefit from them. And I think I agree with Tucker on uh, probably most things, but... It seems like you know I don't know uh, I would, um, uh, but um, but he was on Fox News you know but he got fired from Fox basically for being too honest you know he was you know um, uh, but he uh, is now on Twitter which has become X so he's got a show um, which is you know streamed or it's uh, available on Twitter or X um, but also you can watch this on YouTube so I highly encourage you to watch it it's half an hour long. And it's uh, I just watched it. I think what yesterday, two days ago, uh, I think yesterday, and um, really amazing. Um, so this Javier Millet guy, look, I I don't know much about him yet, but in half an hour, in, with thoughtful questions, you can really get to know a lot about a person, and from his eyes and from his words and his responses, um, I like the guy, and I would vote for him. And anyone from Argentina or anyone who knows someone from Argentina, I would strongly encourage you to, to vote for him or to go, uh, you know, encourage others to vote for him. Because in a nutshell, I'm going to lay out some reasons um, why I think that's a good idea. But he's a, a libertarian or you could say classical liberal uh, economist. And um, he understands, which is also my, if you have to put me, label me, I would say that's my political leanings. I believe that the ideals of socialism, of everyone, you know, having as much opportunity and equality and happiness as possible, that is terribly achieved through socialism. The goals of socialism are very, very well achieved through capitalism. But the thing is, when people think here capitalism, we they, again, it's like these words, socialism, capitalism, what do they mean? Real capitalism, the traditional meaning of it, is a system of freedom. It's the natural way that humans operated throughout time. You trade, originally it was through barter, through trading things, um, but it's a voluntary exchange where you've got fish, I've got firewood. Oh, I have more firewood than I need and I'm hungry. You're cold and you have more fish than you need. Okay, let's do a trade. And we negotiate that ourselves. We don't need any government, some knight or king saying, all right, you know, you do this, you do that. Uh, no, we can do it ourselves. And if we're not happy, we won't engage in the trade. Um, and then if one of us tries to force the other into the trade, then that's where the knight or the government comes in and says, hey, you're breaking the law. You're not allowed to do that. Um, 
So we, we had barter back in the day and share. Of course, sharing. We can all share with those we choose to. So voluntary sharing, voluntary um, barter, exchange with others who we want to. Um, and then that evolved into money, using money where, oh, um, you want firewood, but I don't have firewood. You've got fish. Um, all I've got is, uh, let's say, um, I've got some vegetables. Um, uh, all that, whatever it is, right? So I can trade my vegetables for some, uh, all I wanted food, right? So let's say all I've got is uh, some flint for making fire. Now, so I can, uh, you don't need that. You've got enough. So I can trade my flint uh, for, to someone who's got firewood and then trade that firewood for your fish. But that gets complicated. So money comes in where oh, everyone's going to accept this gold or this silver or whatever it is. And so, or ch cacao, chocolate, you know, whatever. And everyone trusts that, the value of that thing. And so um, if I, I can uh, trade, uh, I can sell my uh, flint for some money, and then I have that money, and whenever I need something, oh, I need fish. Here, take this gold. And you go, oh, yeah, sure. I can use that gold to go buy some firewood. So money... So this evolved, this is capitalism. It was the natural way of sharing and then barter and then trades through uh, naturally uh, occurring currencies. People knew gold, silver, you know, or in some cases chocolate or whatever were, would be universally valued, you know, and so they used it. Then over time, states started to get involved. It began with, you know, powerful people, you know, had, had a bunch of, you know, accumulated resources and enough resources to fund a bunch of dudes with swords and um, that became an army, and that became a king, and they were able to basically declare a whole area their private property. And over time, they were kind of, you know, living standards increased, education increased, and um, there was pushback. Economic power and economic freedom brings political power and political freedom because you're not too busy slaving away, um, so you can get informed and you can spend time pushing back against people who are trying to control you which, by the way, I think is a very strong reason why the World Economic Forum and those, you know, WEF and all these kind of types um, are, you know, and I think BlackRock, Vanguard, you know, and all, all you know, State Street all and all these uh, systems around the world, it seem, almost seems like they're geared towards keeping people busy through crushing the middle classes. Well, and of course, if you did that directly, people would fight you. So you'd have to do it through pretending you're trying to help them. And whoopsies, it didn't work. Whoopsies, let's try again. Now, maybe I'm being too cynical. I don't know. But it, it, it's either incompetence or it's corruption. But the systems around the world are increasing the poverty of people. Um, and is that a coincidence that, dis that disempowers the masses and allows for the resurrection of uh, aristocracy? We're seeing a neo-feudalism, neo-aristocracy in the form of the Jeff Bezoses, the Bill Gateses, um, you know, uh, so Mark Zuckerberg's, whatever, you know, these huge titans, you know, um, and then you've got the traditional families, you know, whatever, been powerful for a long time. So point being is the state started to develop, uh, um, but then people um, started to become wealthier as things were being successful. And so then these uh, kings had to kind of, oh, okay, pull back a bit and more freedom was granted to the populations. Um, but over time... The state, um, so you get you got right, gave rise to these states, right? The state of Ireland, the state of Germany, the state of you know the Brit, um, Britain or whatever, and it's this government, right? Um, and there's the idea that it's here to help us, but for most of history, it wasn't here to help us. It was a private family business, which owned a territory, and that's the heritage. We should keep that in mind. That there's this um, the state. Um, only in certain the certain areas where there's never been a state which is genuinely trying to help the, the common people. There have been places, though, where the USA, for example, um, where uh, or Scandinavia um, in the past, it seems they're returning that way now, or, um, you know, Ireland, it seems, some people say a long time ago, before the British, uh, you know, long, long ago. But, oh, for oh. Um, but it's, you know, um, there's been periods around the world where governments have basically said, okay, look, um, yeah, everyone, you can do what you want. You have freedom. We, the government, are here just to pr you know, protect justice, basically. 
So, um, and you know, it's not perfect everywhere, but the, uh, but it, especially in the USA between the civil war, the end of the civil war and the beginning of the first world war, there was people flocked there from all around the world and they got nothing from the government, but they were able to work and keep the fruits of their labors. Right. And so there are no taxes. And so they were able to slave away there. A 30% of them left for whatever reason, you know, um, but those who stayed, they were able, their kids were able to get better jobs and, you know, get ahead. And then their grandchildren were in university, you know, in many cases. And, and so there was this upward, incredible upward social mobility, the American dream. And that came because it was limited government. What, you know, Javier Mille is talking about basically of um, transitioning towards, um, which is basically saying that socialism, unfortunately, even though it sounds wonderful, it is actually the cause of our ills, our problems. And when the state in modern times, say starting about 100 years ago, started to get more involved in the economy under the guise of helping us, it actually every single time has made things worse. And I'm going to explain a bit the theoretical side of, you know, um, and Millet, everything I've heard him say is in line with this, you know. Again, I haven't heard much of what he's got to say. I've heard him talking for half an hour. But... Um, but it's an important point. You don't need to agree with someone on everything. You just need to agree with them on most things, right? Or agree with them on more things than the alternative candidates. And um, I'm sure that's the case with him. Um, I'm also sure that's the case with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. in the USA. I think it's very similar to Miele. So I would encourage you to check him out. Um, uh, anyone who isn't aware of him yet. Um, RFK Jr., the nephew of President Kennedy the son of um, Robert F. Kennedy Sr., Senator Kennedy. Um, so he's also talking about freedom, you know, give freedom and power back to the people. Say the government is not, is, needs to take a, a smaller government, a smaller role. Maybe RFK might be a little bit more into using the government. I think, um, uh, you know, the USA has got a bit of a complex situation. So using the government more actively, I, I don't know exactly the difference there, but RFK is definitely all about freedom and free markets and trying to, you know, restore liberty um, and, you know, health to the people. But I think in America there's maybe, it's a bit different to Argentina, there's certain things where you need to be, you know, different challenges. However, they're both, they're both coming from the same place, and they're both coming from a spiritual place, it seems, of um, love, and uh, you can see that from his eyes, you know, the way he talks, the way he smiles, you know. So basically the state, um, so uh, I'm going to give a brief um, explanation of why classical liberalism, or you could call it libertarianism, um, or limited government, um, why that's better than socialism, and why all the countries of the world at the moment, basically every single country, they're socialist to varying degrees, um, which might surprise you. You might think, oh no, cap capitalism runs the world. Well, you know, it's part capitalism, part socialism, right? Um, we've got hybrids everywhere. Um, but uh, nowhere is there a very pure form of capitalism. And in many places, there's a very, you know, very pure form of socialism or, you know, 90% pure, 100% pure. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, but uh, if you're going to stop here, I just say, you know, Javier Mille, go check out the Tucker Carlson video. It's half an hour long. You could watch five or 10 minutes of it and it'll give you a great idea of um, Argentina. Basically, it was a very wealthy country. Um, and hundred years ago and then with uh, socialism things basically gradually have been going, going downhill for a long time and they've got hyperinflation where you have to carry wads of cash to buy things and a lot of people have left the country I've known a bunch of people who have said they left the country because of the, the inflation and the situation I think just maybe the feeling of you know it's not pleasant right when you feel like the leaders of your country are just selling it down the river you know um so I'm very hopeful for that. I think it's really exciting. He's the front runner. He's predicted to win. Um, and uh, I think Javier Mille in um, Argentina, um, uh, Markovic, my friend Markovic, says that a guy, Bukele, I haven't looked into him at all, but um, Noija, something Bukele, I think, is the president of El Salvador. He's saying that he came in and he was very tough on the gangsters. And he basically um, brought you know security to El Salvador and then now, you know, freedom and, you know, people, you know, getting on doing their, you know, with their business 
creating better lives for themselves and others through creating value, helping each other, doing their work, sh trading, things are going in a very good direction, according to him. So, um, so then, and then Robert F. Kennedy Jr. in the USA, who's encountering extreme fierce f um, resistance from the elite in the USA, very rightly so, because all going well, Robert F. Kennedy, he's the most popular candidate for president, but he needs to beat Biden to become get the Democratic nomination. So that's the challenge. Um, and uh, the DNC, you know, the Democratic National Committee, they're trying to rig the process so that um, the people don't get to choose their candidate. It's these elites get to choose. Um, but uh, very inspiring stuff. They're both, you know, and so these, I see this as a wave of people starting to wake up around the world. Like things are not going right. Things are not working. And what is going on? How do we fix this? And then certain voices are saying, here, I've been thinking about this my whole life. This is what I feel is the answer. And, you know, truth has a different frequency to falsehood, you know. And, um, you know, uh, very clear truth, you know, 80% truth, 20% mistake has a, a better feeling than 60% truth, 40% mistake. And so these voices, people who have just they've gotten in touch with reality and thought very clearly and pondered and they've become wise about the way to lead, um, they are beacon lighthouses of hope um, um, and beacons of opportunity which um, people are flocking towards. And um, it's a really beautiful thing to see because I think the world right now, we're in a very, um, be honest, we're in a very dangerous situation. Many... Um, I don't think fear is useful at all. So I encourage you to be completely peaceful. And look, if we all turn into slaves, say la vie, you know, but at least we can do our best to um, go to, the, to whatever end with dignity and courage and virtue and awareness. Um, however, you know, I think we all need to wake up and understand that um, incompetence, uh, like mistake, and also corruption and malice you know ill will not only are they the norm throughout history for governments people kind of sinister or you know zealous ideological people who are very extremely confident and set in their own position um but not open-minded they flock to power and they're often very good at out competing other people in power games um you know four percent of the population of the world Every, every, across culturally everywhere uh, roughly four percent are psychopaths and a lot of them they're not violent you know but they will manipulate people and so that's just you know i guess it's a, s a spectrum really we're all got a bit of that in us um and so um you know these kinds of people flock to positions of power and throughout history they've been the norm in in governments mostly it's awful and most of the crimes and mass murder throughout history has come from governments now um so you have that throughout history. So why would we think that that wouldn't happen in the West and in democratic countries? And why would we think the World Economic Forum with their you will own nothing and you'll be happy uh, trying to help us? Or like, you know, you know, or why would you think the World Health Organization trying to get a pandemic treaty so it has sovereignty over the world and can declare emergencies any time at once, why would you think that that's not a power grab? I think a lot of people have um, blind, the blinders on and they're thinking that's not possible. But it's been the norm throughout history, so why wouldn't it be the norm? Why wouldn't it be possible now or in the future? Not only that, in 2023, in most of the world, this is the norm. Most countries aren't democratic, you know? And um, so, you know, wake up, like, uh, my friends, you know, with respect. Like, anyone who thinks, oh, this is crazy, like, uh, it really is possible, and so we need to be. We need to wake up now. The solution is freedom. It's liberty. Um, let the people do whatever they want, so long as they're not hurting other people. And so you have a decentralized network where I I try to solve people's problems so that they give me money. If I can solve your problem, you will try to force me to take your money, Jamie. Please take my money. Whatever you're doing, that's of more value to me than this fifty euro note. I've got other euros, but that that thing of value. I want it. Here, take this. I'm benefiting from this exchange. And then I go, well, you know what? This service I have or this good or whatever, um, I have a bunch of that. That's my business. So I want that 50 euro note because then I can use it. That's more useful to me. 
So it's benef- mutually beneficial, win-win, and it's mu- therefore it's mutually voluntary, and we we engage in that. Now, um, and if I'm not, if I can't help people, no one's going to give me money, and I'm going to have to go work for someone else, or I'm going to have to rely on someone, some support, um, uh, or family, or the state. You know, for now we've got welfare state or whatever. Down the line, I think probably we could uh, do away with that um, uh, safely, you know. But for now, it seems like, you know, transition is wisest, you know, not to rush into it. We don't need to do that right away. And, you know, maybe there will always be some supports um, through the state because commun- there's less community these days. So maybe we need some replacement. I don't know. But um, nonetheless, basically, we have a decentralized system through liberty. Is I, I have free will. I can do things and solve people's problems what they want and need i can provide it and if i can do it you know at a reasonable balance of uh, quality and uh, price then they will give me the, their money voluntarily or they'll, they'll barter with me and um when the whole the whole planet does that and the whole country every individual you know is doing that then we have this um decentralized network just like the internet just like the, you know a body or just like you know um a forest all these natural ecosystems, just like um, everything in nature, these decentralized, um, beneficially um, beneficial positive feedback loops and systems of when uh, naturally it finds equilibrium. And so, and I'll go into a bit of detail here, like how that works. And I am going to talk about you know the problem of so- socialism and what I mean by that, and you know why liberty here is the solution, and why I agree with Mille what he's saying about much the same thing as me, you know? Um, so basically it's a, um, I can solve people's problems. They give me money. Um, I can't force them to take my money. If I try to force them, then that's, I'm violating the non-aggression principle and the state puts me in jail. And so that's why the state is beneficial at this time in history. Maybe one day we'll all be Buddhas and uh, enlightened and we won't need a state at all. But for now, I think we, we definitely do. Um, and I think, you know, so, you know, some people make the case for private security companies. I think we consciously, we're not ready for that yet. Um, we're not at, that's only, that only makes sense if everyone's perfectly rational, but we're not perfectly rational. A huge, not, you know, we're all on, to some extent, sleeping, sleepwalking, spiritually. A minority of the population are fully spiritually realized. And a, a lot of people are quite far from that. So we need to be real about where we all are. I'm not perfect. I, I've got a lot of work to do. And I think we all have work to do. So... For now, the best system is uh, classical liberalism, or you could call it libertarianism, where with you know you can basically you can trade voluntary um, exchanges, um, and if someone doesn't want my stuff, okay, I uh, tough pickies, I go out of business, and so naturally, say you have um, whereas the government tries to provide these things, um, there's no competition, so there's no incentive for it to be a good quality. Of good, whereas in capitalism, um, these decentralized networks say a hundred people go. Okay, I'm going to you know provide uh, healthcare in this uh, city. Hundred you know clinics open up, and say fifty of them, uh, let's say you know um, five of them, uh, or maybe it would be one of them. You know, is um, negligent, and they they hurt people because they weren't taking enough care. Well, they go to prison, you know, because you're breaking the law. That's you know violating the non-aggression principle you must not be careless and um, endanger people like that. So that's fine. And then the other 99 who are actually, you know, they're paying attention and they're not being ne- criminally negligent um, or just criminal, you know, intentionally criminal. Um, say 50 of them do a pretty good job and people give them their money and they start to grow. And 49 of them, uh, they don't do a good job. Maybe the people aren't good at their job. Maybe they're lazy. Maybe they're disorganized. Maybe it just wasn't the right place, the right location. And they disappear. They go bankrupt. And so there's a selection mechanism like Darwinian evolution where um, then you've got the whole ecosystem just exp- is expanded upon by those 50 successful ones. And they might go, oh, look, at there's this clinic, doctor's clinic with all this equipment, which has just gone bankrupt. I'm going to go buy that from them and help them pay off their debts. Um, and then now I've got two clinics. And, you know, so these successful ones start spreading and taking over. And then maybe 10 years down the line, another 10 of those 50 have gone bankrupt from, you know, these things happen. 
But of the 40 that are there, you know, they're getting bigger, they're doing great, things, people are learning. And there's people who are, get jobs in there and they've gone and been moving up the hierarchy. And eventually they're like, why am I being an employee here? I can go start my own clinic and uh, I've got all the skills. I know exactly how this system works. And then they leave and they go start their own ones and they become the competition. And, you, and it, the cycle repeats where anytime a monopoly starts to form, where one or a few companies start to get really big and so, hey, there's not much competition. We can raise the prices um, and no one can do anything. People from their company will start, or other company, people just starting, you know, from outside, they will start to create smaller equivalents of them that provide the same quality of service or good at a lower price, at a fair price, you know, quote unquote fair, like a, a, a price that people will pay and which will still allow them to make a profit. And so they start doing that and people go, oh, well, I'm not going to go to that big clinic, even though they've got a great reputation. There's this other clinic down the road. They seem nice. I'm going to give them a shot. And if they are bad, you leave them and then eventually and people, everyone's going to do that and they're going to go bankrupt. Word of mouth, especially with the internet these days, you know, they'll go bankrupt. Um, but if they're good, you stay with them. You stay with them and you do it again. And they start growing. The successful ones start growing in size. And so these big behemoth um, uh, clinics or companies, they will have to start going either like we're losing market share, we're shrinking in our percentage control of the clinic trade in the city. So we have a choice. We can keep shrinking and eventually go out of business. The other thing will just take over with their lower prices. Or we can compete, and that's what they'll do for survival. They are forced to lower their prices, not because the government told them to, but because um, they, they have to compete. And so they lower their prices, and then now equilibrium is restored. So this is an example of nature, the decentralized networks, the wisdom and the organizational power of these things, which no centralized bureaucracy of people with their feet up on a desk, or even people trying really hard, um, very devoted people in a, an office somewhere, government office, they can't organize it that well. It's just like a mathematical um, reality, like decentralized networks can process information and they don't even need to know the big picture. There's too much information in the big picture. And so um, if you've got specialization, you know, people are focusing on their little niche of, you know, this is my clinic and I'm doing what makes sense for it. It's just infinitely more powerful than one, you know, office, you know, run by the government trying to control the whole city's clinics and make them optimized, you know. And that's in every industry it works like that. Would you want the government making your phone, making your car, you know, um, making your food? Can you imagine, you know? Not good. And whenever they've done it, it doesn't work. So Millet puts it very clearly. He says, um, uh, the state can't create wealth. The private sector creates wealth. The state destroys wealth. It uses wealth. Some of that's necessary. It uses wealth, money, you know, um, it, to pay for the, f the, the wages of police officers and um, judges and, you know, bureaucrats and politicians and, you know, uh, the cleaners or whatever, or, you know, the electricians to come fix the, you know, the offices. There's a necessary costs of the state and it's worth it for us. Um, but nonetheless, it's not creating anything. It's using resources. And all the, you might think, no, but the guy, they can give us schools, hospitals. They can, they can only do that by taking from us with one hand and giving back with the other. And there's a few problems with that. One, in the process, they waste a lot of those resources. So they're taking it from the community in tax and then giving it back. But in the process, you know, there's people whose wages need to be paid to manage that. There's corruption. There's lazy people. Um, there's uh, just the cost of, you know, lights and, you know, offices, real estate, wait, um, all this stuff. And, but also, like I said, they're, they're not as good as a decentralized network at information processing. And so they provide a lower quality of service for a higher price um, or good or service. And so, you know, this has been borne out through history, right? It's been shown. Um, and it makes sense, you know, just pri um what do you a priori, just thinking about it in terms of ideas. And so capitalism, free markets, it's a beautiful system. It's the natural system, you know, whereas socialism, sure, it's natural in a way, but it's a later development and it's, a, it's an aberration. It's not a good thing where you, there might be some cases where some socialist elements could be okay, like maybe providing money for single mothers or something like that. 
but there's always you know you're also incentivizing that then and you know you need to be careful often there's um, some blowback or some unforeseen consequences um, or you know give people money for being unemployed to help them but then often people are like well I can work 10 I could take this uh, job but it's only going to pay me you know 50 euro a week more than my unemployment um, support so uh, I'll just you know cut back on costs a little bit and just keep playing Nintendo and so then the economy suffers businesses suffer because it's harder to find workers um, and even that person who's at home playing Nintendo suffers because um, for two th reasons one they're living in a poorer society because they're not pulling their weight and helping it and B because um, they're spiritually poisoning themselves because they're not being responsible um, but this is a perverse incentive, moral hazard created by the state intervening. Nonetheless, it's possible that in some, I'm open-minded. In some areas, we might benefit from that, at least for now, to have some social socialist tendencies. But it should be really minimal. That's the point, you know. And maybe we should just get rid of them altogether. But that's fine. We're so far into socialism that that doesn't really matter for now. We we know we need to move in the direction of shrinking the state. Once we've done that, 10, 20 years down the line, we can have the other conversation of exactly how far to, to shrink it. But um, we know 100% it needs to be shrunk a lot and it's going to take years and years. So we, let's get to work, you know. Now, so uh, socialism. So it's the government getting involved in the economy. They take from the people through taxation, which is theft, basically, right? You're, you're stealing. And, um, and then they give it to people on the other hand. You know, um, but you know, often they give it to the politically connected. You know, these days, you know, governments, they print money out of thin air, which is another hidden tax on us, or they borrow money, which is another hidden tax. Um, there's direct taxation, but then there's these other two methods of taxing, which most people don't know about, which is inflation, they print money, and it takes value from your bank account without you even noticing because the value of your, each of your units of currency goes down if they inflate the currency because there's more units of currency chasing the same amount of goods and services and also borrowing which does the same thing because that debt has to be paid off in the future by taxpayers so it's going on you you know um, now so the government tax takes money from the people and then spends it in ways which are often unwise but even if they are wise that's theft. You're taking, you're violating private property. That's violating the non-aggression principle. Um, now everyone will consent to, okay, yeah, or the majority of people, democratically at least, the vast majority will consent to a basic state of like, yeah, um, who will protect um, the people and make sure anyone who violates the non-aggression principle, anyone who harms others, steals from them, defrauds them, rapes them, kills them, um, assaults them, whatever, um, uh, is brought to justice, you know. Um, but socialism is, w is where you're, it's, as Millet says, you know, at its core, it's, it's violent, you know, you're forcing people to give you their money. Um, and if they don't pay the tax, they get put in prison, you know. You know, that's a violent thing, and they have the monopoly over violence, the government. But it should only be used to stop people who are being violent, you know. Um, and uh, so North Korea is a communist state, right? There is no, there's a black market, but officially there's no market. There's no, you're not allowed to buy and sell things. It's just you work, you give it all to the government, the government gives you some stuff back. Of course, bad people naturally take control of that and then it just becomes a mafia state. Um, and there's mass starvation and horrible things. And the history of socialism throughout the world now, communism is the most extreme form of socialism. It's complete control of the economy by the government, by the state. Um, capitalism, or free market capitalism, libertarianism, classical liberalism, that's the polar opposite. That's complete freedom. Um, uh, and in between, you have um, uh, increasing levels of socialism. So... You know, say in Cuba, I think now you can buy and sell things, but then the government has a strong in intervention in the, 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 the economy. So they're socialist, right? Communists, but more like socialists now because they're allowing buying and selling, capitalism. Um, in China, that would be fascism these days. It's not communist technically anymore. 
it used to be. But now it's um, since Deng, Deng Xiaoping in the uh, 1970s, I think it was, they brought in reforms because China was so poor where oh, they wanted to bring in some capitalism. But basically it's fascism, not like Nazism where there's this racist element, but um, fascism, which is the fusion of corporate and state power. Basically you have capitalism buying, allowing people to buy and sell in, a decentralized, in decentralized networks like we were talking about, but the government can violate your property rights and take your money, take your business anytime you want, tell you what to do. And that's the case in China. It was the case in Italy under Mussolini, in Spain under Franco, um, you know, uh, Pinochet. He was Argentina, I think, right? Um, or was that Chile? My apologies I, um, uh, my, for my ignorance there. But um, so these, uh, you know, this is fascism where um, they just, uh, the government can just take from you, right? But they use capitalism to generate wealth. So it's better than communism. Society is more functional. And then going further, you know, along towards freedom, you have maybe, you know, socialist countries like, you know, well, I'd say, say, um, America, the USA right now, it's a socialist country. People come, oh, capitalism, it's, you know, capital. No, it's crony capitalism, right? So it's an um, kleptocracy, an oligarchy. You have these very powerful businesses, individuals, families, networks of people who they have a lot of money and they use that money to buy the um, political influence. They give money through campaign donations to politicians. Um, they give money to, you know, uh, elect judges. I believe judges are elected there. Um, they give money to for universities and who, you know, who's going to be on the board of this or, you know, charities, um, anything you can imagine, they're giving money. Um, and uh, then those politicians okay, well, we, you want to get re-elected, right? You don't want us to give all of our billions of dollars to help your opponent, do you? Okay, well, then, you know, you can do whatever you want. You're a free agent. But this one issue here, which just happens to be the most important of all the issues, that's off the table. You can't talk about it and you do what we tell you. And that's the deal. Implicitly or explicitly, that's the deal. And um, so you have these politicians who, they're, some of them just want power and attention or, you know, to win the popularity contest, or to feel virtuous. Um, others really want to do good, but the ones who are really virtuous and willing to say, like, you know, Millet or Robert F. Kennedy Jr., they get weeded out and fiercely attacked, and there are defense mechanisms built into the systems where, you know, they don't want these people in there. Um, and this is just the fact. So the USA is socialist, but it's socialism for the super wealthy, most of all. There's socialist, you know, elements for the middle class and stuff, you know, tax a lot of taxation, and then you know there's like in, um, you know unemployment payments and this and that, but the, by you know the by far and away the, the the greatest amount of socialism is for the corporations, the subsidies where you know the government gives them money to help them, you know, with oil or with corn or whatever, the, the government can, brings in regulations where say the hospital system. You can't open a hospital, you can't open a clinic in the USA unless you can get a letter of need, I think it's called, or a statement of need, where the local hospital goes, yeah, we need a competitor. There's not enough hospitals here. And so basically you're preventing competition and capitalism from functioning and you allow these monopolies to form. Why would they do that? Well, I wonder if any, you know, favors or influence or brown paper envelopes stuffed full of cash may have passed hands involved in when the government brought in these regulations. So socialism, it's the government regulating the economy, saying what you can do, getting involved, rather than just saying, hey, you can't break the, you can't steal from people, you can't defraud. It's getting involved in like taxation and then spending, which also, if you bring in all these public schools, then you're driving out the ability for you know individuals to start their own schools because why would someone pay you when they get it for free or more accurately when they're already forced to pay for it through their taxes? If you gave people the choice of, oh yeah, you can go to private schools. Um, if you want, you can pay 10% less tax, but then you don't, you're not eligible for public schools. I think that would be a fair system. You know, go, yeah, we provide public schools, but if you want to opt out, you can do that and you pay less tax. And then you can use that money to go pay for your own private schooling. And if that was happening, 
if the government was wasn't forcing people to take their service and intervening violating the property rights of people by stealing taking their money as tax and then you know regulating the economy making it hard for competition but also just forcing them out by operating these services um private schooling wouldn't be just for rich people there would be cheap private schooling but at the moment the only niche available for private schools is the wealthy very wealthy giving something the government isn't giving because it's above the average level the government's providing um so the government through regulation and through taxation um uh the the government uh and, and then and through spending the government is uh warping the natural system of of capitalism and liberty um and so it causes you know i could go on on and on but uh i've got another podcast uh one of the earlier ones about um is is socialism really so fair and so you could look at that if you're interested in more of my thoughts on that or check out mile or check out you know the mises institute m i s e s mises mises institute um uh or you could check out dave smith who's a comedian who's really really clued on about libertarianism um and he's involved in the libertarian party in the usa um but uh uh part of the problem is his podcast really good podcast and um or check out his appearances on the joe rogan podcast the joe rogan experience they're always amazing very enlightening conversations um so yeah okay so now the usa is socialist right so um they're supporting you know mostly it's uh, socialism for corporations but nonetheless um but it used to be classical liberal right and that's when there was the biggest upward social mobility in history and the biggest creation of a middle class in history at least at that point china may have beaten it by now i'm not sure um but china again that happened through more freedom right and china would be even more successful now if they brought in more liberty and more freedom because at the moment in with the being fascist um they uh you know someone there's so much corruption you know and so if someone's like oh i could leave this say i work in a big hospital i can go start my own clinic but then you know my boss here he's like oh my god how could you betray me and anyway you're being you're now competition for me oh i don't want to have to compete with you fairly i'm just going to you know talk to my pal in the party the ccp the communist party or whatever and um they're going to get that person thrown in prison or you know have them told hey you need to stop this or um you know um and so and they either if they have the nerve they do it and bad things happen maybe few people escape but it's very little um and uh so in general this competition doesn't work you know you have these monopolies still forming and um you don't get creativity people are afraid to do it mostly they just stay ah oh, just stay in the big thing i won't rock the boat and um and so there's less creativity there's less innovation and there's less value for money for the the society and so uh it it's a wasteful less efficient system resources are wasted um and uh yeah innovation is um not optimized so if they could move towards more freedom they would be even more successful and then you know going out you have like all the you know european uh countries heavily socialist in scandinavia for example heavily socialist but there's also cultural factors where they're more homogenous and um kind of unified culturally um and so they're quite happy for you know many people to to pay a lot of tax and get good you know more services but also it seems like there's more of a you know germanic work ethic kind of thing going on where the workers in the government are, are more likely to actually act similar to how people act in the private sector um where the, the culture really values um working properly you know and being strict about that as a status put, placed upon it um but i think in many countries probably most countries in the world that's not the case and anyway scandinavia would be more successful and it has been more successful in the past and i've heard arguments that it is becoming more successful through um kind of removing some of these um tr- uh, socialist things they brought in um through bringing in more freedom they'll just be even more successful um for the reasons already mentioned um now uh so you know this taxation heavy taxation on everyone you know this i think you know you shouldn't pay any income tax definitely and in, in if you're earning under $100,000 a year no income tax but then the government also doesn't give you all these things but guess what instead of losing 50% of your money to the government 
and not being able to open a business because oh, I have to hire a lawyer and accountant because it's so complicated and I don't want to break the law and get in trouble with the tax man. It's like, no, oh, if you, you know, if you're criminally negligent, you'll go to jail. But if you just don't run it very well, well, you know, people won't give you their money and you'll go bankrupt. That's it. You know, do it however you want to do it. So many more people will be able to open businesses and will be, will take the plunge, you know, and start opening businesses. And so, um, through, you know, I think uh, we shouldn't be um, paying income tax and even very, very wealthy people. I'd say, you know, I, we could transition towards that, you know, less of that, a minimal, minimal state. And the thing is, it wouldn't be like, oh, you take away, you know, s socialist, you know, programs, the state spending on, you know, all these things and we're going to be poor. No, like you, you know, cut taxes by 80%, cut regulation by 80%. And then down the line, once you've started to reap the benefits of that, cut government um, spending by 80% and kind of phase it out. You'd probably do it in a few rounds. And that's what Millet is doing, it seems. He's got, uh, he talked about in that interview, the first round of reforms and the second round of reforms. And he's saying, look, you know, it's good for even the government workers. In the first round, they're going to keep all their jobs. That's all remaining there. But then once the second round of reforms um, are brought in, um, the uh, government jobs will be shrunk, but it'll be fine. They will be able to um, get better paying jobs in the private sector and to, you know, um, to be able to create, create something more, you know, interesting and unique. And they can, if they want to be an employee, they can work for someone else, but a lot of them will be able to be their own masters of their own destiny, you know, create their own things. And so it's going to be, and you're going to be living in a more happy, prosperous society, peaceful society, because people are more peaceful when they're more prosperous. Um, they're also more perceptive, more aware and conscious, um, wise when we're under less pressure we've got more resources to get educated and just to have time to think and just to relax and not get so wound up and stressed so they'll be living in a better society and so all over the world this is the case so in europe you know socialist very socialist um socialist capitalism you know um and australia too same thing all of the developed world is like this um and it, when you get start getting to you know the developing world a lot of their you know, um, there's not this welfare state, you know, say Bolivia, my man Jose tells me that there's no, you know, support for if you're unemployed, but people, you know, they, they can be un um, homeless and then you see them 10 years later and they've got a business, they've got a family, they work their way up there, you know, and so there's maybe because they don't have that support, they're forced to go, they go collect um, cans and to get them recycled or I don't know exactly, he told me there's some ways you know, they'll be doing stuff. They'll be, you know, finding work, you know, because they need to. And there's ways to, f to make it work, you know. Um, and um, that's also a country where there's a lot of, all around the world in developing countries like this, there's heavy corruption. Um, and the state, you know, um, tries to regulate what you can and can't do. And in some cases, you know, there could be other problems of crime and, you know, the results, trauma, the results of colonialism and things causing crime and, you know, violence. It's, it's, you know, it's a more complicated picture. Nonetheless, in um, Africa, Asia, Latin America, there's a lot of places where there's so much corruption that it's, it essentially is socialism of another kind where um, the government is intervening in the economy but just by breaking the law. Maybe on paper you have free markets, but in reality you try and open a business and do certain things and someone comes and you know they threaten you or they kill you or whatever, um, and you can't do it, you know, so it's essentially um, fascism, you know, like China, you know, where the government can come knock on your door and just take your stuff, or the mafia, or, you know, the cartels, whatever it is, say Mexico being run by the cartels, that's a fascist state, essentially, um, where it's, uh, there's market forces, it's capitalism, but um, there's, um, to a certain extent, there's, um, you know, certain things you can't do, um, or these you know, people will come and violate the non-aggression principle and they're not prosecuted. Um, by the way, I would say we should end the drug war, which is also part of classical liberalism, libertarianism. If you, call, if you commit a crime, it doesn't matter if you were sober or if you were on drugs when you did it. So, and most people who take drugs, they don't hurt other people. So it's not fair, it's wrong. The government is violating the non-aggression principle if they try to bring in drug laws. And so, yeah, maybe in some cases more drug use will go up temporarily, um, but it's worth it because the drug cartels will collapse. They will have no money. They'll be forced to go into just human trafficking, just these other things. 
but you're shrinking their resources and it makes it easier um, to uh, – makes the police less corrupt. There's less incentive to be bought off um, to supplement your salary. And um, the cartel can make less money because, oh, why would you go to a drug dealer to buy drugs when you can go to a nice, shiny, regulated business where you, they give you – they tell you what exactly what's in it. If it's unhealthy, you know, they're going to get shut down by the government, by the health – you know – or you know, um, for, you know, or for breaking the law, or you know, if it's not a good quality service, you go somewhere else, and then they'll be bankrupt within a few years. You know, as we talked about, um, uh, and you know, in Portugal, by the way, they decriminalized all drugs in two thousand, and drug use went down. Okay, so that would be one point there, and health outcomes improved in society. Um, so. Um, like rates of HIV went down because people were able to get clean needles. They didn't have to hide, you know, they were, hey, I want clean needles. And the people go, okay, here you go. You know, the government was supporting them, treating it like a health problem. So anyway, um, so even these countries where there's no real so social welfare, there's no welfare state, it's still the government interfering in the economy. They still don't have liberty. It's not uh, a classical, it's not a classical liberalism, libertarianism. It's um, essentially a form of fascism. Um, so all around the world, we need the same thing. We need the light of liberty. And I'm going to ceremonially turn on the light here. If you're listening, you might not notice. You might hear a dull click, possibly. But if you're watching, you'll see I'm very dark right now because it's evening time. So one moment. Bon homage, Akhorja. I should say for Nigiman. No homage. I'm talking in plural in the beautiful Irish language. So, okay, so um, now this is, you know, talking, this is socialism, the whole world is suffering from this um, centralized control. Government's trying to, even if it's for good intentions, but I would say, you know, let's be honest, bad people like power and money. And so in most cases, I think it's, you know, malevolence is involved in at least part of the government. It's often the, the senior levels. Um, get captured by very, you know people working just for profit, their own profit or the profit of some huge corporation um, who wants to take control of the economy through controlling the regulations um, and the taxation and the spending. Um, and so they can direct it to their benefit. And so all around the world, we have the same problem where um, either through um, corruption and, you know, s selfishness and just, you know, bad intentions, just, you know, tyranny, you know, domination, um, or through good intentions, but, you know, um, misguided good intentions where people, governments or people in the government are really trying to help through socialism, but they don't realize that the system is flawed, you know, fatally flawed from the start, from the get-go. Um, they, whatever the motivation, we don't, it doesn't matter ultimately what the motivation is because we know what we have to do, then we know the system doesn't work. So, um, so we need to wind back socialism. We need to shrink the state, get the government out of our lives. Doesn't that sound wonderful and hopeful? Imagine, you know, just like the government, like 80% less involved in your mind, 80% less forms to fill out, 80% less tax to pay, 80% less rules you have to worry about, um, 80% less, you know, nonsense and when the governments are less powerful it's going to be much harder for them to go you know fighting wars with each other also because they're they've got less resources they have to focus um it'll be easier for us to control them also if they've got less resources we can keep a closer eye on them and at the moment most countries they know everything about the citizens they're surveilling everyone through the phones and stuff they know what we're doing you know uh, and, the, you know, say the NSA and, the, and the, the intelligence agencies in the USA, which is an invisible empire. I love America, but America is captured by this parasite of, you know, um, fascistic um, intelligence, military, corporate, um, you know, oligarchs um, uh, who are globalist. Ultimately, they want, you know, global power, which is the whole, you know, WHO pandemic treaty stuff and, you um, the, the uh, WEF and, you know, you know, dominating the UN, trying to, you know, all these um, agencies, which might sound really nice, but they've been captured by the same people who capture all the governments. Um, and so the answer is not centralization. The answer is decentralization. And if we can have the freedom 
of the you know 19th century America with the technology of the 21st century planet um we're going to see a golden age like has never been seen before um and this is incredibly exciting i think and when you see millet rising in argentina and um other people around the world rfk junior in america um i'll take mark Ivick's word that um his man in el salvador is uh something of the same ilk um, i'll need to look into him um and I hope more people like this can emerge around the world who will say, look, the job of the, go- of the president is to shrink the power of the state. Whether, whether they're doing it for good, you know, with good intentions or bad intentions, it's irrelevant. This is a failed experiment. It doesn't make sense in pure logic. And we have the results. So let's, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And therefore, socialism is a type of insanity. And this is coming from someone who was a socialist. When I was younger, I believed socialist capitalism was the answer. I read a book uh, called by Ha Jun Chang called 23 Things They Don't Tell You About Capitalism. And I think there might be some benefit. There's definitely some useful ideas in that book. But since expanding my reading, I believe it's uh, flawed in many ways. Um, and uh, there can be a benefit from the state say Adolf Hitler, of all people, used the state, um, I believe, by expanding the money supply in order to invest purely in productive enterprises. He um, radically, very quickly uh, improved the economy. Now, he was doing that to create a war machine, but originally, at first, everyone was like, wow, isn't this amazing? Germany is back on its feet. How beautiful. But um, So you could make the argument that that would be beneficial, but the problem is who controls... That system and how can we ensure that they're using it in a wise way and at the end of the day um, centralized bureaucracies aren't as efficient um, in general maybe the Germans is an exception I don't know um, at you know running you know an economy they can't do it Um, and so the answer is to shrink state power um, and return the freedom and the power to the people and Naturally, we're going to start creating um, ways of solving each other's problems, which is what we were doing forever. And a closing thought I'll give you before I finish here is just to say that, you know, some people say, no, you know, the government does create wealth. You know, we need socialism. It's going to help, you know, the poor. Okay, no, socialism hurts the poor more than anyone else. Um, and the wealthier you are, the more influence you can gain over the, the system. And you can use it to um, uh, warp the playing field of co- fair competition. Where there is no state intervention, there's pure competition. And there is the maximum um, deterrent against monopoly and the maximum um, benefit for individuals um, and maximum opportunities for the, the poorest people. But everyone, but especially the poor. The poorer you are, the better liber- liberty is for you. You know. Um, but uh, think about this: if that were true, that socialism was actually this amazing thing, why did it take? Uh, how did we? How is it that it only began a hundred years ago, when economies have been developing for thousands of years? How did those economies develop to the point from the Stone Age onwards? To the point where we're advanced enough around the turn of the, you know, um, 19th, 20th century, you know, where, you know, 19, early 1900s, socialism starts coming in um, on the back of all this technology and all this stuff that's already really developed that couldn't have been done, you know, 100 years earlier. It couldn't have been done, socialism, you know, all these, the state wasn't, didn't have enough power, didn't have enough control over the population to make everyone pay tax and, to do this and this and to, uh, communications technology to micromanage things so much. How did we develop, I wonder, to such a point where socialism, this little parasite, was able to start developing? It, it, clearly, there's an alternative way to develop, right? So that would be the natural way, which is liberty and free markets, capitalism. And now you might say, okay, well, fair enough, there's you know, socialism is not the only way to develop, but it's another way to develop. 
And I would say, yeah, that's true. Um, but look at the track record. Thousands of years, no socialism, things getting better and better and better and evolving. And then the last hundred years, um, just, you know, so much decay. And technology has been improving, but I'd say, that, you know, if you look at the evidence, it's very clear that that is in spite of socialism, not because of socialism. And we would be far ahead if socialism hadn't been pulling this dead weight on us. And the countries that are the freest are the most successful. And um, the, uh, in, in principle, we, um, we can see why this makes sense. And just from the historical track record, we can see it. So socialism is an unfortunate misstep, which has appeared quite recently in our history. And um, I'm very excited that it seems there are leaders um, taking the stage, are ready to lead us in a better direction. And I hope more and more leaders can um, be inspired by these people around the world. And that the more importantly, most importantly, that we the people start to wake up and become more educated and take seriously our duty, our responsibility to become educated about these matters uh, and, and, and to communicate with each other, to help each other become more educated and to challenge each other when we think we're wrong, but to, with open-mindedness and respect and an awareness that we're all on the same team, we're all trying to work for a better world. Um, and that if Argentina is more successful, Ireland, Australia, the USA, Nigeria, China, everyone will be more successful. The more, it's win-win-win. The more successful any other country is, the better it will be for all of us. Now, Millet is being resisted by the press around the world um, because the press are, around the world are largely, you know, the mainstream media are largely bought by the same forces who would be terrified that another Millet is going to appear in their own country. And so there is this struggle going on, and I invite you to become aware of it and to become our peaceful warrior of awareness in um, this very exciting battle for the soul of our planet and our future and to take us you know, we're at a crossroads where you know um the great reset and you know agenda 2030 and you know all the, the climate change thing you know being hijacked to try to control people and the whole covid stuff you know clearly doing all these t the exact opposite of what you should do if you're trying to limit the spread of the disease um but if you're trying to conglomerate power then you did the perfect thing you know and there's all these things where we need to become aware that we're at a crossroads between centralization and global domination and tyranny and decentralization and liberty and the flourishing and flowering of human potential and love and beauty and creativity. And it's going to be much more interesting, much more enjoyable. And it is what you want for you, your friends, your family and the next generations thereof. And, uh, so, yes, we, we, um, we must become more aware and um, we, we can uh, create something really, really nice, you know. Um, so, okay, I think that's it. I'm going to sing a little song and uh, that's it. Socialist pirates, yes, they rob I and you Stole I from our privilege and rights Minutes after they took I From the bottomless pit Of their wars and historical traumatic expressions Oh, why can't they just give it all up? And get with the program They and their children Will reap the benefits Just the same as us We're all here just to sing These songs of freedom That's all I ever had 
redemption song redemption song these songs of freedom that's all we really need redemption song of returning the world to the people that's it thank you for listening or watching everyone um go check out you know javier mille go check out robert f kennedy jr um and uh go check out classical liberalism also called libertarianism, also called free market economics. And just um, the idea that we, our lives are our own, and if you're not hurting someone else, no one has the right to get involved, and that we can create a really beautiful world. And, um, and it's very exciting, and we shouldn't give up and just say, oh, it's too complicated, I don't, wanna, I don't have time to think about it. The truth is you don't have time to not think about it. So welcome to the movement and um, welcome to the more beautiful world. Thank you all.